Hello again, everybody. It's good to be able to talk to you again. We've got some good things to talk about today. Just a, a quick update. I've had two sessions of, of uh, physical therapy. I feel like I'm getting stronger every day. I'm, I'm walking some on the walker. I take it slow and easy because this knee keeps trying to go out a little bit, but I got a brace on. I hope as the days and weeks go by, I look forward to being able to stand before you in the church one day, but who knows? We got between 1,000 and 2,000 new cases every day in Alabama of this virus. We hope that all soon goes away. Just a few things about Jesus. I'm going to be using some, some scriptures from the 13th chapter of Matthew. It'll be 1 through 9. And then, then it'll be 18 through 23, some things that we know. Jesus was a great, great teacher. And he also used parables. Now, were all the parables he used, were they parables that he came up with? It could be, but some of them could have been already in the Jewish rabbinic culture. They used parables a lot back in those days to teach or to illustrate a message that they were trying to get across. And Jesus was just so good at it. But today is the parable about the sower. Jesus used things when he taught that the people were familiar with. And back then, they didn't make rows like we do and plant seeds down in, a, in rows. They sowed. They scattered the seed. Now, down in around Jerusalem and Judea, a lot of that area was quite arid. It, it was desert land. But where Jesus grew up in Nazareth, a small village, they probably had a little bit better soil and they might have had a, a, a bit more rain than the other part of Israel and Judah. So he knew about sowing. He probably did some of that himself. So he's, he's going to render this parable to us. And, and not all of his parables he would go a little deeper into. Sometimes he would, he would tell a parable and then he would leave it to the disciples or whoever were listening to him to interpret it. But a lot of times he would have extra verses here in Matthew that, that he would use to explain the parable deeper. And so, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. So here he's on the Sea of Galilee where he did a lot of his teachings. Verse 2 says that such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. Now why did he do this? One thing, he, he did have a lot of people that would try to rush him, try to get close to him try to touch him, try to be touched by him. And so it would be hard for him to teach a bunch of them all at one time unless he got out in a boat. That's one reason. He got out in a boat. They weren't real big boats. The, the average fishing boat was, was not that big at all on the Sea of Galilee. So when he went out on the boat, though, and the people were on the beach, a lot of people back in that time and place would use the water to help heighten their voice. When he was speaking across that water to people huddled there on the beach, they could hear him better. So that's another reason. But he's in a boat and he's teaching. He told them many things in parables, verse 3 says, and he said, listen, a sower went out to sow. Verse 4, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. So just like us today, if we sowed, I think people still sow turnip grains and stuff, but you know that that seed is going to, find, going to fall on different types of soil and in different places. 
So some of these seeds fell on the path, Jesus said, and the birds came and ate them up. So nothing's going to come from those seeds. And then verse 5, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. In verse 6, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. All these different conditions that Jesus is talking about. If you sow, you're not going to get something from every seed that falls on the ground because it falls on different conditioned places of the ground. Verse 7, other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds, verse 8, other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then he says, since this is an important parable that he's rendering, he wants to give an important message let anyone with ears listen. Now, if we just read this parable up to the point that I've just gotten to, it, you know, everybody has a picture of somebody going out, probably having seeds in a bag or something hung over their shoulder, and they're just scattering seeds. They're throwing them on the ground to the right, to the left, and maybe some before them. You, you can picture that. But we're not talking about this literally. I mean, these literally happens. People sow seeds. But what is the what is the message that Jesus is talking about? He's going to explain it in this parable, and that's what we really need to listen to. Verse eighteen. Hear then the parable of the sower. And in verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it. So, so here he's transferring from this literal sowing seeds to what we have to receive the teachings about the kingdom that Jesus was so good at teaching about the kingdom. What is it? Do we receive it? Do, do we really hear it? Do we just hear the words or do we take it in? Is it becoming a part of our mind, our consciousness? If it is, then it's going to take root in our heads. And there's going to be things grow from that. The teachings of Jesus, very important, but he's already saying, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom... And does not understand it, which so many people don't. The evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. On the path of our life, things are being sown. Jesus says sown in the heart, which in the New Testament, most of the time, if you hear the word heart, we know it's not talking about the blood pumping heart that's so important to our bodies, but heart means the mind. The mind is where the heart is, our hearts. And it's also deep in our minds, in our very center of our existence, very center of our psyche. That's where God is also, within, God within the kingdom within, so the kingdom and the teachings of the kingdom that Jesus was trying to transmit sown in our hearts on the path of our life. And so when we hear it and we don't deeply understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart, what is sown on the path of our life. So those seeds can't take root because we don't understand it. It hasn't sunk in. It's not in the 
fertile ground of our understanding, which is mind. It's, it's our mind and our heart. Intuitive things are heart. Rational things are minds, but Jesus is talking more about intuitive, deep knowledge about the kingdom. In verse 20, he says, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, just like so many over the years hear the word, and they're so, so joyful to hear it, but it seems to land on our own rocky ground. And what happens? Well, verse 21, Jesus says, Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. Listen to what's being said here. We've witnessed it so many times. People join the church. People become baptized. And they're so joyful about it that they get caught up in that moment. But as they continue to live, things happen. Trouble happens. Persecution happens because we now call ourselves Christian. People make fun of us. And then we fall away. People fall away. The seeds that were scattered in our mind, the words of Jesus, are not taking root. So we turn away. We go back to whatever we were doing. And in verse 22, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and yet yields nothing. All these negative things that we accumulate in our life, our, our greed, our envy, our, our fondness for things of the world, we get pulled back away from it. And so all of this, all these negative thoughts we have and all these temptations choke the word of God. And so nothing is yielded. And then our last verse, but as for what was sown on good soil, Lord, we all want good soil, don't we? We want good soil in these minds, in our consciousness. We want something that will receive the word heartily. We have to do things to make that happen. We have to deeply listen we have to ask other people, what does this mean? What does this really mean? If we're full of, of temptations, if we love the word, the world more than the word, what happens? But if it's on good soil, this is the one, if, if one has good soil, a good place for these seeds to bear fruit, to grow. This is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, and another 60, and then another 30. So examine yourself. I examine myself all the time. Is there anything good growing within me? Is the kingdom growing within me? If the life is my life fruitful, am I yielding things from all of this from the word? And am I growing in the faith? This is important. Ask yourself that. May we pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the teachings that you have imparted to us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for that voice within, your voice, Jesus' voice. And may we know, may we have the assurance, the sweet assurance, that we have received the word and we are bearing fruit as your children. Lord, protect us, keep us safe, and we pray for all those that suffer because of this virus. 
Bless us, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.